Hey, this is Mike Freilink. I'm the pastor at The Gathering, and I'd like to welcome you today as you listen to this week's message. I pray it encourages you, challenges you, and draws you closer to God and His purposes for your life. Well, good morning, family. Good morning, friends. How wonderful it always is to gather to lift high the name of Jesus and to encourage and fellowship with one another. How blessed we are to firstly know Yahweh, our Lord and God, and secondly, to share our lives with each other. I think each of us together make a beautiful family that I'm so grateful to be a part of. A special shout out to all our mothers who are here today and those mothers who are watching online. Motherhood is such a precious and an important role, one to be taken most seriously. And I think that it is appropriate, despite all Michael's jesting, I think it is appropriate, at least on one day of the year, if not more, to honour our mothers and mother-like figures in our lives, to say thank you for everything that they do, all the love and care that they provide for us, everything that they have sacrificed along the way that we'll never know about and everything that they have invested into us. Why don't we give all the mothers and the mother-like figures in the room a huge applause. Thank you. Thank you. Today I believe that God wants us to be reminded of his priorities, what he values, and what he says we should invest our time, our treasure, and our talents into. I think it's interesting that Carly shared around that exact same thought this morning when her and I hadn't even spoken. She doesn't know what I'm going to share today and vice versa. Yet I think it's interesting that God encouraged both of us to share along those lines. The title of my message today is The Greatest of These is Love. Our key text comes from Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 to 40. It's titled, for those of you who have those little titles in your Bible, as The Greatest Commandment. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which of the greatest command which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbour as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Who enjoys a contentious, juicy debate? Some might even call it an argument. Others may prefer to label it a robust conversation. However you label it, there is some intense back and forth engagement between Israel's religious leaders and Jesus going on here, isn't there? To better understand the motivations of the religious leaders in this particular section of the text, it's important that we review the happenings from the previous day. As we've been learning in our discipleship series, many thanks, Ethan. Being aware of the context, the author and the audience are very important when reading and interpreting texts. So let's touch on the happenings from the day prior to when this question was posed to Jesus. Well, what has become known as Palm Sunday to us, Matthew records as Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. The religious leaders are looking on as huge crowds begin to spread their cloaks on the road for Jesus' donkey to walk along, whilst other people cut branches from palm trees and spread them on the road, an ancient red carpet, if you will. Matthew says that as Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred, is his language. Now, historians estimate that during the time of Jesus, the usual population of Jerusalem was around 25,000 people. Except for during a festival or a Jewish holiday, then the population would swell by about four or five times that amount. 
Now we know in this particular section of the text that we're reading today, Jesus was coming to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover, which is one of, if not the most important annual Jewish festivals. So four or five times the average population of 25,000, if my calculations are correct, leads us to 100 to 125,000 people. That's a lot of people who were stirred and who were questioning, who is this who heals? Is this the man we've been waiting for? Who is this who has authority? And could this be the long-awaited Messiah? So after this baffling procession into Jerusalem, Jesus proceeds to enter the temple courts. He turns over the money tables furiously and he exposes many of the religious leaders as the frauds that they were. Afterwards, Matthew records that the blind and the lame came to Jesus in the temple and he healed them. Children began to erupt in praise and they weren't just saying, they were actually shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. The chief priests and the teachers of the law were having a hard time with all of this. Now let's realistically picture this day through their eyes. Seeing Jesus ride into Jerusalem as a king in front of over a 100,000 people, cleaning out the temple and restoring it as a house of prayer, demonstrating authority over sickness and disease, and then from the mouth of babes, the final straw that broke the camel's back. Praise that was only fitting for the coming long-awaited promised Messiah. Now, Jesus, being so wise, decides to leave the religious leaders to digest all of that day, and he leaves the city, and he goes to spend the night in Bethany with his followers. But very early the next morning, Matthew says, Jesus heads back into the city. So this is the day that our text takes place. First of all, as he enters the city, the religious leaders outright question his authority. Jesus proceeds to speak in parables, stories, to the crowds in front of the religious leaders. At the end of the first parable, Jesus looks straight into the eyes of the religious leaders and delivers a shocking blow when he says, Truly I tell you, the tax collectors, the lowest of the low, and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But tax collectors and prostitutes did believe him. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. This understandably seems to trigger some ill feelings from the religious leaders towards Jesus, and they begin to plot and scheme his demise. As they are looking for a way to arrest him, but keeping in mind that they are afraid of the large crowds who are hanging on every word that Jesus is saying, the Pharisees think that it might be possible to trap him in his words, how ridiculous, and into saying something that might be erroneous or blasphemous. After all, he's uneducated. Their master plan is to send their disciples to Jesus and barrage him with questions. So after they've done that, then the Sadducees have a turn. They come to him with a question, intending to trip him up too, unsuccessfully, of course. And then upon hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together again and sent an expertly trained Pharisee, an expert in the law, Matthew says, to question Jesus or more precisely to test him. He challenges Jesus to name the greatest commandment in the law, meaning the entire Old Testament and the Scriptures. This is the context in which our key Scripture takes place. Now, these are very learned men. In fact, these are men who have spent their entire lives memorising, studying and debating the Scriptures. They knew every single word of the Torah and they would have been well acquainted with every level of detail in the Mosaic law. I'm not sure if you've attempted to memorise Exodus or Leviticus, though maybe you've read Numbers or Deuteronomy. 
Those books of the Bible are crazy detailed. I like detail. I'm a person who appreciates detail. But I don't know if there's even a word to describe the level of detail that God goes to in those books of the Bible to outline what's important to him, what he values, what daily life should look like, how we should relate to one another. Suffice to say, Yahweh went to great lengths to outline all of his expectations and commandments. And the religious leaders challenging Jesus knew every single one of them. I can picture the one expert Pharisee who haughtily asks the lowly carpenter from Nazareth, So Jesus, which of all the commandments do you think is the most important. Then without missing a beat, Jesus answers directly and simply that the greatest and indeed the first commandment is to agapow the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul and all your mind, referencing Deuteronomy 6 verse 5. Agapau is a verb, it is an action or a doing word and it's used to express the action of love, the expression of love. The definition of the verb agapau is to welcome, to entertain, to engage with, to be fond of, to love dearly. Jesus is saying we are to welcome the Lord our God. We are to engage with, to be occupied with, to be fond of, to love dearly the Lord our God with everything we are, with all of our heart, soul, mind and strength. The noun form of this word is agape, which we're all more familiar with. And in case you thought I was just pronouncing it wrong, they're two different words. Agape refers to the unconditional, sacrificial, selfless and divine love of God. It's important to consider the root meaning of the original word used in this scripture because sadly we've lost much of our meaning in the English translation. But also in our modern use of the word love, so much has been lost. Our culture has often equated love with simply just an intense emotion. It's used more often in a context that love is just stronger than like. I love the way Jade effortlessly sings with the voice of an angel as she leads us in worship. Now, maybe what I should have said is I like or I appreciate or I value the way Jade effortlessly sings with the voice of an angel when she leads us in worship. It's the modern use of our word. And often we'll say things like, oh, I love your new haircut. I love ice cream. I love my car. I love porridge for breakfast. I love winter. What about, I just love the way Michael used to start tickle fights or ridiculous joking around and silliness with our children just after I had settled them for bed. I had read to them. I had prayed with them. I had sung them a lullaby. They were all ready for sleep. And then in comes dad with nonsense. Now, I didn't actually mean that I love that, did I? I actually meant I dislike the way that Michael used to do that. One word love can mean various things, can't it? Depending on the context and the way that we have twisted the meaning in our modern use of the word. And then with a bit of sarcasm thrown in there too. 1 Corinthians 13 is helpful here. It lays out a list of things that define a little bit more specifically what agape love looks like. A list of do, does and does not. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonour others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. 
So now with a little more understanding around agapao love or the expression of love and agape, the definition of the unconditional sacrificial love of God, as well as the context in which this scripture takes place, let's come back to Matthew chapter 22 again. So after Jesus has directly stated that to agapow God, to love God with everything is the primary commandment, he immediately goes on to say, the second is like it. Agapow your neighbour as yourself with the same expression of love, with the same action of love that you have for yourself, you are to love your neighbour. All of the law and all of the prophecies hang on these two commandments. This was huge. These religious leaders didn't realise that they were getting a two-for-one deal. They had only asked what the greatest commandment was, singular. Instead, Jesus gives two for the price of one. Now, for the first time in two days, there is no response recorded in the scriptures from the religious leaders. After all the back and forth, after all the testing, all the questioning and trying to trip Jesus up. Now, perhaps they are processing what Jesus said. Perhaps they are fuming and they walk off. It seems likely that they had no interest in truly loving others with an unconditional, selfless, humble love. To love others in an agapow fashion means that in the same way we take care of ourselves and are concerned for our own interests, we are to take care of and have concern for the interests of others. So when I'm thirsty, I'll go and get a drink. When I'm feeling cold, I'll go and get a jacket or a blanket. The challenging question is, am I equally as concerned for the needs of others. An article published on the Bible reference website of Got Questions Ministries says, now Jesus concludes by saying that all the law, all of those books of the Bible that I spoke about before, all that meticulous detail, all the law and the prophets depend or hang on these two commands. In other words, All of the law, all of the prophecies ever given from God are designed ultimately to motivate and enforce love for God and love for people. So to put it another way, gathering, God's greatest desire for any human being is that he or she would love God and love people. Everything else we ever think about God, believe about God, say to God or do for God must be motivated by this core impulse. Ultimately, all the rules and all the directives in the law flow from the ideas of loving God and loving others. There is abundant proof throughout Scripture of the paramount importance of operating from a foundation of love. In no uncertain terms, love, especially between fellow Christian believers like us, is meant to be the primary and the most powerful outward sign of one's Christian faith. By our sacrificial, selfless love for one another, Jesus said the world would know that we are his, that we are his disciples, John 13, 35. Believers are to love one another because love is from God. And according to John, anyone who does not love others cannot possibly even know God because God is love. 1 John 4 verse 7 to 8. So to know God requires a person to have a relationship with him, which is something that John highlights repeatedly in this particular letter to Christian believers. Love comes from God, so he says it's logical to conclude that those who demonstrate love show that they have fellowship with him. Chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians concludes with the thought that only three things will ultimately last forever. And he says they are faith, hope and love. And Paul says that the greatest of these is love. I don't often refer to the Amplified Bible, but in this instance, I think the elaboration is helpful. 
So I'll put it up on the screen. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 13 in the Amplified. It says, And now there remain faith, abiding trust in God and his promises, hope, which is confident expectation of eternal salvation, love, unselfish love for others growing out of God's love for me. These three, the choicest graces, but the greatest of these is love. I appreciate the way that that is worded, unselfish love for others growing out of God's love for me. My key thought today is that of all of the things, family, that we can put time and effort into in life and of all the things that we can raise our children to value and prioritise, loving God wholeheartedly and loving others selflessly has to be first. You may not be a mother or a parent, but you may be influential in someone's life. Teach them how to be compelled by the love of Jesus to reach out to others. There are so many people in our community here in Caloundra and on the Sunshine Coast who are hurting, who are broken, who are dysfunctional and lost simply because they are unloved. It's not only kids who act out when they don't feel loved, you know. Adults do too. We must be compelled by the love of Jesus Christ to reach out and share the best news ever, that you are loved and Jesus proved it by giving up his life so that we could live with him forever. When we are fully convinced that we worship the actual creator of heaven and earth, And when we have a revelation of how richly we are loved and how freely and completely we have been forgiven, of how gracious the covenant extended to us truly is, there ought to be a powerful excitement arise within us that erupts in love, that expression of love to agape our God with all of our heart, mind, soul and strength that will naturally erupt. How easy it is to love the Lord our God with all of our life when we remind ourselves of how richly we are loved, how freely and completely we have been forgiven. Now the discovery of why Yahweh is so deserving of our love is often a beautiful journey with light bulb moments, an epiphany if you will where we see, we feel and know how deeply we are valued by God, how much we are treasured by God, we are wanted by God, we are cared for and loved. Gathering, we love God with all of our heart when we are living a loving, faith-filled and passionate life for Him. It means living each day on purpose, living each day in close connection and intimate relationship with him and allowing him to lead the way. It's hard, almost impossible, I would say, to love someone that you know nothing about. But as we get to know him, which is the focus for us as a gathering this year, as we get to know him, we begin to experience his unconditional, unending, unfailing agape love. It begins to make all the difference in the world and the natural response back to him will be one of worship and love. Loving God with all of our life also looks like sacrificial giving and the laying down of our own lives for the sake of others. The Apostle John suggests that the ultimate sign of love is to lay down one's life for others, Jesus being the supreme example. In 1 John 3, verse 16 to 18, John highlights the fact that there needs to be a real world application to what love looks like. He emphasises that love cannot be reduced to simply an emotional response or a feeling, but rather we must help others in need with action and truth. 1 John 3, verse 16 to 18 says, This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. 
Jenna, would you like to come up? So as I conclude this message today, I'll turn again to 1 John 4 verse 8. It says, whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. In essence, that scripture is saying God is the creator and the sustainer of love in our world. If we don't emanate that love, how could we possibly know him because he is love? So I'll leave you with three things today. Empowered by Jesus, you and I can do three things. Firstly, we can experience the love of God. To feel and know how deeply you are valued, you are treasured, you are wanted, you are cared for and you are loved by God, that is available to each and every one of us. We can personally experience God's love. Secondly, we can respond by loving Him back in an agapow manner with all of our heart, all of our soul and with all of our mind. Thirdly and equally as important, you and I can share that agape love with others through our lives. My overriding thought in my message for us today as I said earlier, is of all of the things, family, that we can put time and effort into in life, of all the things that we can raise our children to value and to prioritise surely loving God wholeheartedly and loving people selflessly has to be first. Amen. Amen. Let me pray. Lord, please help us to receive your word to us today and help us to not only receive your word for us personally, Lord, but help us to receive your word so that we can act on your word and not just be hearers, but also be doers of your word to us today. First and foremost, Lord, we are so grateful. Words don't even come close to expressing how grateful we are for your sacrificial, unending, unearned love the fact that you can always love us despite our flaws even when we're at our very worst even when we're rebellious and we push you away the fact that you continue to love us and pursue us and reach out for us God is just too amazing to comprehend because there's no one like you God there is no one like you and that's why you're the only one who can love us in that complete way Thank you for your love today. I pray that every person here and every person watching online, Lord, would receive of your love today. Help us, Lord, to receive that love and then channel that love to other people in our lives, Lord. How wonderful you are, Jesus. We celebrate you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.